There's not so much fuss around this uh, technology. What's happening there? Okay. Um, Okay, we start. can I start? Yes. Okay. Okay. So go ahead, Marion. Okay. I just uh, I mean to follow the standard procedure to introduce uh, very briefly, obviously, because I don't know too much about Professor Milo. So uh, this is uh, Professor uh, Yoval Milo from uh, uh, Warwick University Business School, and uh, we are very uh, pleased to, to have him here for uh, this session, which is originally was like accounting, finance, and economics kind of organized, but nowadays this is all uh, our business school sessions. And the topic will be associated with accounting yeah. terminology, perhaps. And, uh, welcome, and, and please uh, thank you. Extend your introduction. <laughs> and, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so, as, as I mentioned to Siobhan, Vice Siobhan, um, this is more of a conversation, okay? Because it's the first time I'm presenting some results from uh, a project that I was involved in for the last three years. So, but let me first, because I know this is streamed and everyone is recorded. So, the, the, the organization that allowed us to do that is the Business Council for the Business Council for Cooperatives and Mutual, so BCCM. Now, BCCM is the, is the umbrella organization for mutuals and, and co-ops, cooperatives in Australia. And many of their co-ops there had problems because they were facing hostile takeovers and sometimes they wanted to take loans, but they could not show that they had equity because of the structure of many of your accounts, right? Uh, as, uh, there are different ways of doing that, but if you join, for example, as a member into a co-op, you buy a share, but the share remains at the nominal amount. So the, the organization may accumulate uh, capital in all kinds of forms, but they cannot prove that they have this capital. So when they come to a bank and they say, oh, we'd like a loan that we want to be a new supermarket or buy a new ranch, if it's an agricultural one, they say, okay, let's see what kind of collateral you can put out of that problem. So they went to BCCM and said, maybe some small companies can come and create a framework or help us to prove our, our value. So this is when they got in touch with uh, Paul Thumbar. You'll see he's on, he's on the, uh, or Paul Thumbar got in touch with them and um, they got us into uh, looking, examining many of those uh, organizations and finding out how, what are the ways in which they generate value and how to measure that value. So we basically traveled around, it was very nice for COVID, we traveled all around Australia for about two years, uh, interviewed hundreds of people in 12 different organizations and came up with um, six different ways, six different, um, if you like, uh, areas that need to be addressed when, when you're looking at value creation by, uh, by a mutual. Okay, so this, this is the framework. Now, the, where the framework is, is actually up and running. There are quite a few organizations now, they use it, and they use it, if you like, in anger. They actually use it in order to go outside and then generate some capital for themselves, or um, sometimes it's a, it's a beginning to defend hostile takeovers by, by commercial share, shareholder-based organizations, as you know that they do. A lot of people here work on, on M&A or, or on co-ops, this happens quite a lot. Okay, so this is what we did. MBM, if you, if you can check, this is mutual uh, measuring mutual value measurement. That's our framework. If people are interested in, in finding out more about that, that's the website. So coming out of this, this is what we got paid for, if you like. But coming out of this, of course, because we did so much research, coming out of this is a mountain of data, most of it uh, qualitative, and because I knew that the 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 um, the uh, audience here is, is mixed because I didn't know how many how many people are going to be around. I thought, right, let's do something that anyone in a management school or a business school can, you know, can communicate with. 
So I decided to, uh, to work with this. As you see, this is really work in progress because even the title changes a little bit. Okay? Um, I think that's one. Yeah. And um, let me kind of show you. That's the first glimpse from, from our research. So we, sorry, the clicker here doesn't work, so I'll just do it like this. Uh, to accountants, there's no, this is no big news, right? Profit is the most ubiquitous performance measurement that you can find. It's most widely accepted, and um, you know, uh, it is something that anyone, even if they don't know the first thing about accounting, would would, would recognize. Profit, okay? The calculate the result of the calculation that that is recognizes profit. Now, as a result, it's become uh, a really requirement. Right, a real requirement. Really, you're you're supposed to say something about your profitability, even though you may not be focusing on profit. In fact, it is so deeply entrenched in the way we think about organizational identity that we actually split the organizational world, or very very crudely, of course, to for profit and not for profit. That's one of the most common ways of looking at uh, the organizational landscape. Of course, this this is not an all capturing. Uh, taxonomy, but it's a very common one. So it shows you how deeply embedded is the notion that profit is something that's really important for, for organizations. Okay, so this is what we call a public measure. So a public measure. I mean, people who study study public measures. I don't know if people did that. There are all kinds of uh, all kinds of strands of research on public measures, but but at a very basic level, we can say a public measure is a measure that your organization is expected to uh, to communicate to. You need to say something about your profit bill, at least in one way. Now, it's true that there are organizations that go uh, against profit. For example, some not-for-profit specifically say uh, that they are not-for-profit and they don't care about profit, about the, web, about the website, but, you know, as I say, the lady does protest too much, right? The fact that you need to say that you're not for profit and you don't care about profit shows you how central profit is. So even that shows you how ubiquitous it is. Right, so this is the starting point. Also, very uh, you know, deeply for-profit organizations are not happy about profit. Uh, Netflix is one of them, another one for, for many years. I don't know if people follow the, the, the finance people here who work on corporate governance or on um, on communication with investors. Amazon for many years specific, specifically said in its letter to, to investors that they don't care about profit. You know, how, how many years that, uh, yeah. did it take until Amazon? No profit for six years, and it's yeah. worth low in 1997. Exactly, exactly. From 1997, if you follow the letters, they said, right, we don't care about profits. And they have a whole story why they don't care about profits. So profit, you can see it's problematic. It is not something necessarily that is good for the organization. And Netflix, for example, uh, Netflix, uh, we work, of course, we work with all kinds of trouble going on, but quite a lot of those new economy organizations were, were measuring themselves or preferring to measure themselves using something else, not necessarily using profit, because they said, hey, we're about market shares, we're about, if people can remember this, we're about, we're about um, how many downloads we have, we're about growth and they, they started creating all kinds of profit related measures which were not really profit because they took away so many things uh, from them and of course people who, who do quantitative uh, research probably know about uh, Nanga uh, presentations of profit uh, and that too and how analysts react to them so we've got quite a lot quite a lot about the kind of nuance or very varied landscape with regard to profit it's not just Everyone, you know, says, yeah, we, we need to report profit. This is what it is. Profit has a not very, um, and this is a public measure, I mentioned this. Now, the thing is, um, as, as, as organizations deal with, with their profitability and, and how they position themselves, it, it affects their behavior. If you go back, Netflix, of, uh, not only did uh, they report different set of measures, but they also created their structure differently in order to, or at least they, they report that way in order to show that they don't really care about the way profit is measured uh, using IFRS. So it affects the way the organizations behave. Now, the thing is, we don't know much about that. 
there's some research, and I, I just uh, put um, one citation here that shows that organizations, and we know it, we all work in universities, that organizations um, change their behavior in order to rank higher in all kinds of league tables, right? Well, in working in UK universities, we don't need to, to say that much about it. So this is not a very uh, controversial, I think. We're not gonna uh, have a whole discussion about that. Now, if that's the case, if they react to, to, uh, to, to measures, and profit is the most ubiquitous measure, surely uh, organizations change the way they behave and think about, now start using kind of cognitive language, managers start thinking about the, the identity of the organization in relation to profit. So if we are a new economy uh, organization and we're saying, right, well, we're at the, growth, at the growth stage. So surely we don't need to think that much about profit or profitability in the next five years because we want to grow. So you see, there is, there is a, at least a reason to believe that there will be a match between how they see profit and what kind of uh, organizational identity they, they assume at any time. And I put here, you know, these are people from Lego that captured this. Now, um, now if, we, if, we, if we take this as, as a kind of, as a building block for, for our hypothesis, we can say, right, if that's the case, if we assume that there is a connection between profit and practices of organizational identity, that is the way the organization talks about itself, behaves, so we'll, we'll talk about calculated practices, what do they calculate, and also about its structure. Then we want to ask how, how does this happen? There's very little research that puts together profit and organizational identity. Now people from uh, org, org, org theory, org studies, I don't know if they are in the room, there is, yeah, are you org theory? The literature on, on organizational identity is, is huge, right? Shelves upon shelves. Uh, in accounting, very, very few. So it's about time, I think, that we, 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 we put these two together, especially as we, we, if you like, kind of now disciplinary pride, we hold the most ubiquitous performance measure, or at least we can say something about it with, with confidence, <coughs> which is profitability and profit, okay? So this is the motivation for the paper. Now, a bit of theory, really, again, we're going to because there's not a lot about it in accounting, we went, I don't can you see this? Can you see this? This is a, okay, great. I really like that one. That's a fingerprint. Um, we went to uh, draw theory. Uh, Dennis Gioia, a famous um, org theorist, came up with uh, a, an idea that really in order for us to understand how organizations uh, interact, uh, create and perform their identity, we should look at identity not his words, mine, as a verb rather than a noun. Uh, identity is something you have to put effort into so that it maintains itself, so that people believe in it, rather than just, you cannot just put a logo on the wall and expect everyone to, to identify themselves with the organization. You have to do something about it. And he came up with three areas of, of identity practices. One, it has to be central to the organization. So if you build into your identity, if you want your identity to be effective so that people would, would actually identify with that, it needs to be central to what the organization does. Secondly, it needs to distinguish. It needs to say, our organization is doing A, B, and C, but we're not like the others who do X, Y, and Z. So it needs to create, maintain, and demonstrate distinction. Thirdly, it needs to um, create continuity. So it needs to tell people, you see, we're part of this uh, line of, of research or this line of activity. The, the most obvious example is if you pick up a bottle of wine, and many times it says, since 1876. Since, right, you know what I'm saying? Beers, so beers can be from 1340, whatever it is, right? Continuity. We were here before, we are here now. If you continue supporting us, we'll be here in the future. Okay, that's part and parcel, then uh, Giorgio tells us, of, of, of identity. Now, we would like to say that we think how you deal with profit is basically part of that. Okay, so how you build your identity has, because profit is so uh, really at the core of what business do and how businesses think about themselves, it is also core, we believe, into their identity making. Uh, okay, again, my language, but, but then, then Gioia and the people who followed him really spoke about identity as, um, as a process, as an ongoing process. I forgot to say at the beginning, feel free to ask questions <coughs> along the way. Okay. 
If I speak for an, for an hour, my voice will be gone. I'll be bored. You'll be bored. You don't want that. So feel free to, to ask questions along the way and kind of, and you know, and, and of course, uh, argue with me, challenge things because it's the first time work in progress. This is all, it's a research day, right? So research is built on discussions and debate and, and everything else. Okay. We said that. This is just a summary of the three areas that we find that we basically take from Joya's uh, theory to explain, uh, I mean, to explain identity building data. Right, so that's the part of the data that I was talking about. Uh, we examine this question using 240 interviews. Now, we, we, in this paper, you will see we will only focus on four organizations because otherwise I'll be talking for six hours. Uh, but really, the analysis, the, the coding of the, of the interviews is based on 240 interviews and thousands, I didn't count, but at least 3,000 uh, pages of, uh, yes, of uh, data from the organization. So yeah, just before we get into the data, yeah. yes. you did invite questions. question. So please, 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 please. I, yeah. I, yeah, very interesting. I know Dennis Joyer's work, and I, I get where you're coming from. I Thanks. Think this, this idea of, um, you know, kind of spotting this lacuna in the, in the accounting studies, finance studies field, and saying, well, we haven't, we haven't paid attention to the organization. Yeah. I to totally get that. I guess when I think about this, um, let me be, be provocative. Could you, can you recite the Warwick University uh, mission? Uh, no, I can do WBS though. Right, okay. <laughs> because they, they really are the change makers. I couldn't tell you what UE, UE mission is. I know there is one, right? I mean, they, the yeah. senior management team got together and like okay. decided how they wanted to represent the university to the, to the world and that's right enough. Point. Okay. So, so my point is, you know, there's something about organizational identity, which is rhetorical. And it's often the pro it's the the provenance is it's kind of coming from senior management. I, I agree completely. And people who work in the organization. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Peter Case. Peter Case. Case. Yes. Do you people working in your organization wouldn't necessarily kind of connect with it at all. So the way they identify would be very different. So it's it's not simply organizational theory that you're trying to do. It's also social theory I would argue. Okay. Everybody, I promise I didn't pay him. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we sit in the day. We definitely right. see, you'll see. Yeah. see. I think it was. I just have a clarification question um, about the difference between a mutual and a cooperative. I'll, I'll say it in a, in a second. I'll, I'll say it in a second. Okay. Yes. Uh, I may ask a quick question. Yeah. Would the organizational identity change over the years? Yeah. Um, very good question. Yes, but I, I, mean, I cannot tell you anything about it because. We didn't stay there for so long to see that. You're absolutely right. Of course, organization, as I said, you know, it's, it's kind of inherent into the, into the theory. If it is a process, surely the process may change its direction. And as kind of Peter implied, and you will see, it may lose its efficacy over time or become just uh, not a lot more than a rhetorical device at some point. But yes, absolutely. Um, so maybe it's the, it's the time to talk about mutuals and, co and co-ops. I don't want to get into the, the you know, there's a long road of history about the, the definitions, but in general terms, okay, I'm simplifying it just to make things easy. Uh, these are for profit organizations, but the profits are distributed you know, under different conditions to the members. Okay, so if you become a member, uh, I don't know, I'm sure that by the way, many of you are members of co ops, you just don't know, right? Uh, you, uh, you have a call, a call back account, maybe. Are you members of AA, no roadside assistance? You're members of a co op. But the thing is, you don't get paid dividends, right? Or, or on the shelf because it's, it's being kind of uh, plowed back into the organization. Make sense? So, for profit organizations, but not shareholder based. Is there a difference between mutual cooperatives? I'm familiar with yes. cooperatives, but I was Yes, there are, there are differences. There are differences. So, so, um, Again, it's, it, it, I don't, I don't want to yeah, start yeah, going yeah. into subdivisions, but, but usually the mutuals are, are distributing and co-ops do less of a distribution. Okay? But this is like put a, a big asterisk yeah. to that because it changes across the sectors. These are, these are basket terms for, for these organizations that are kind of, I, I don't want to say in between, I don't want to get into, into definitions, but they are, they are for profit, so they are not charities. Okay? Um, but, oops. 
but they are uh, not distributing their profits just like shareholders do. So how do I get this one from, from Carlos? Okay, cool. So I'm gonna present findings from four organizations and we chose these four organizations because, um, and uh, this is something we identified, they have different, I mean, I'm now telling you, I feel like I'm spoiling a little bit, they have different degrees of success in actually being effective in using their profit to, to generate a good um, identity, okay? Uh, these are not the real names. You probably don't know this organization, but some of the others are very well known. So we, we, we were asked to, to keep them anonymous. Uh, large Integrated Grain Storage Handling and Trading Cooperative. Basically, they take this grain from the fields, put it on trains, carry it all the way down to a port, and then they ship it out from basically from well, what they say from, from West Australia to the world. So this is this is what they do. Uh, they their members are farmers and they for their membership the organization does this for them. They handle the grain from the field to the train and then to the ship. Now uh, they have a declared purpose and that is to create and return value for its farmer, farmer members. This is directly taken from their, from their documents. And when we, we went and spoke with the members and we said, what does it mean to you to be part of the mem to be part of a uh, serial call? And this is a typical uh, answer. I've grown up with them, my father is a member, and I know what role they have to play in the growers' profitability, because that's my family's wealth. Okay, I know what they're for, and I know what role they play in me making profit. So that's my profit. That's my farmers, my my farm's profit, and it's related, of course, as as, as did we see here time and again, to how they operate. Also, they work very hard on uh, or express very very um, vividly their distinction. So uh, again, a member, not not senior management, talking here. We don't have shareholders that we're trying to deliver profits to. We're just trying to do the best service we can for our members. Now that sounds great. Uh, like a lot of for-profit organizations will, will will say that, right? I mean, you see quite a lot of nice uh, adverts and, and you know and on TV how everyone is one big family and the bankrupts like to. So the talk is nice. So they do they do talk a big talk, uh, but do they do anything beyond that? Follow the bits. Uh, when we started asking them, well, how do you measure your, your profitability? The main um, element that they speak about and, and they, they refer to in their accounts is something, this is not the real name because we don't want to expose their measure, but we call the farmer's benefit back ratio, which is basically a ratio between what they call grower value and capital employed. A capital employed is pretty much what we can think, you know, equity, but they also have long-term debt here, at the denominator. Here, because the net profit uh, returns that they get for basically for giving the, the, the co-op their, their grain year after year. So there's continuity here. And also indirect growers return. So they calculate what is the return that the growers get by, from using the infrastructure of the co-op. For example, the train lines, the storage facilities, uh, the checks, basically all the overheads that you can think of. Divide this by the other, that gives you uh, the, the FBBR, the farmer's benefit bank ratio, and that is the basis for calculation of how much rebate they get. So because these, remember, these co-ops do not uh, distribute profit, they they do this, this following, we wouldn't call it trade, but this following accounting operation at the beginning of the year you stop paying i'm simplifying again but basically that way you pay you the farmer pay the, the the organization the fees for the handling of the grain and so on and at the end of the year after they sell everything after they they manage to to, to transfer everything they give you a rebate and of course the rebate can be higher than the fees could be zero so you get all the handling for free and of course you get the money for for the actual grain itself but you may also get some uh, some uh, some return from that. Now, what do we see here? They don't only say, they don't only talk the talk here. 
where they say, oh, we're not like them. Remember this kind of GOIA distinction? And we saw it quite a lot. Oh, no, we're not like the, uh, the, the car deals and, and other grain uh, for profit uh, grain handlers in the world and so on. We're different. We are, our intention is not to enrich some, some shareholders. We want to do best for our, for our farmers. And, you know, we listen, not politely, but we're skeptical because we, we are social scientists. We need to be skeptical about this. But then we saw that. And not only senior management, but also the farmers told us, yes, I check them every year. And I want to see that my rebate is really reciprocating what I think they say about me or what I think they, they hold up to be true. Right? So profit is really profit handling, if you like. Practices, calculative and distributive practices of profit need to walk the walk, not just follow the, uh, the discourse. Okay, so that's one. Uh, drive Club, uh, this, is, this, this is just a, a web a picture, but this is what they do. It's an, it's an organization that anyone in this room has heard about, they are international, but we looked at the, the, the organization, one of the Australian state, founded 115 years ago, what we call Drive Club, is a regional membership club, offering roadside assistance, that's the main thing. Uh, also car servicing repairs, and more more recently they started creating uh, side, uh, what's well, the called gigs, because these are organizations that are run by, by Drug Club, but they offer insurance, finance, home security, and travel services. And again, we see we see distinction work. We we don't keep our profits, we don't we don't pay a dividend. We actually reinvest it for you, the member and the broader community. This is from, from senior management, but we saw it for members as well. They are very keen on showing how they differ from for-profit, usual for-profit organization. We found this all across uh, the organizations we, we spoke with. But here we also saw something else. The Rive Club uh, operate all kinds of organizations that provide services. So for example, the travel agency, the, uh, the insurance business, the repairs business, all of them are fed uh, from, from um, surplus, from, from internal profits that come from members' fees. So this is, the, if you like, the internal plowing in, and they have contractually obligated that they give three, it's, it's almost, almost always a third of the profit. It changes, but very minutely from year to year. So the profits are distributed in the club in a firm of something that they call member value dividend. They do call it something like this. We changed the name a little bit again for, for anonymity reasons, but what do we see here? They do calculate something that any accountant would say looks like profit, but they don't report it externally. We, we, we have access, of course, to the internal documents and we see that. And it is used in order to generate um, member services. So slightly different approach from uh, from what we saw in Serial Co-op, but also uh, use, using the the profit internally. Um, yeah, this is question so far. So we see kind of two now. They are very different organizations in terms of their history, in terms of what they do, where they are located geographically. But what puts them together is that both of them and other organizations here have this, this is what we call the dancing with profit to begin with. They have a, an interesting dance with profit. They, they know that they have to, to, to calculate it. They know that they have to use it somehow, but they don't want to identify it, identify with it completely. They don't want to say, yes, we are for profit and profit is good, and this is what, what motivates our managers and so on. They always keep a distance. They're always at an arm's length from profit, but they do recognize that it's very useful for, uh, for running an effective uh, business. So I don't want anyone to be disturbed, this talk, thinking, oh, yeah, these guys are talking against profit. Not at all. Okay, It is definitely something that is uh, part and parcel of what they do. Now we move kind of even deeper, if you like, into profit-related business, and that's a financial institution. Um, it's a credit union. In fact, it's the largest credit union in Australia, so now we can find out which one it is if you really want to. Uh, provides a, a, a range of personal banking, business banking, and personal insurance products. Um, and they, 
This is again from, from an interview, but also they say they try to be true to their origin as a as mutual bank. So what happened with this bank, as we saw it, we see it many times in, in, in mutuals and co-ops, a small organizations grow, uh, gradually merge over the years and become larger and larger. Basically, I mean, we see it in, in, for, in for profits as well, you know, they buy each other and gradually some of them become really hefty. So this is what happened to them, but they say that they try to remain true to their origins. They really want to kind of maintain their identity uh, that, that makes them um, unique. <laughs> what do they do in order to, to maintain their identity? Because immediately we ask them, okay, good, that's, that's wonderful. What do you do about it? And they said, well, 3% of what we, we, um, we make as profit is allocated to what we call mutual good causes. So we take 3% and we have a committee that decides which charities, which projects we, we're going to put this 3% into, and we invest there. And this gives them a very interesting, um, gives them a kind of permission to create a very interesting discourse. They say something like this, yes, we like profit. Of course we like profit, because the more profit we make, the, the bigger that 3% is going to be. And so we don't care about profit per se. And we don't care about profit because we, we don't uh, generate dividends. But the 3% becomes larger and we can help more people in society. But along with that, I have to tell you, and if you want to um, yeah, include another slide because it's going to be very, it's going to be very well. The managers there spoke quite a lot about profit, just the way we would expect managers in a for profit company to speak. A lot of their KPIs are, are profit related. So you start to think, okay, so they do the 3%, but how, how deep does it go? Um, they they talk about this, so this is discursive. They also talk about this well, long term. We've been here for 71 years, we want to be here for a lot, lot longer, uh, and your ability to generate enough profit enables us to be here next year. So it's for sustainability. Basically, they say, if we don't make profit, we're going to be out. And that's a shame because we're such a good player in the market. And I do believe that they, they believe that. This is not just talk. They really believe that this is what they do, but you notice that they talk quite a lot, but in relation to what we saw in the previous organizations, they do less. They do calculate this, but uh, we didn't see uh, from a lot of the people, we didn't see from, from uh, um, middle managers and, and for, from, from other boards in the organization such a uh, such high degree of identification. We didn't see, for example, in this organization something like this. I've grown up with that. My father is a member. Now, that organization also exists for 71 years. They should have, at least, if, if it works well, they, they should have some legacy of, of membership. We didn't see it to, to that extent. Now, it is true that in this organization, there's a lot of homogeneity. Everyone is a farmer. They know where they are. All of them do the same business. They know exactly what the organization does for them. Here in the bank, there's a lot of uh, variety, all kinds of customers. Also, remember that the, this is a, an outcome of a merger of different organizations. So it used to be the, the nurses uh, mutual bank, because nurses at the time couldn't get, it was difficult for them to get uh, mortgages. Then there was the uh, policemen and so on. And they gradually merged with some regional uh, banks in this Australian state. But there still we can see that they have a problem in relation to how well they manage to, to use their profit in order to drive their identities. And we're going, if you like, down in the efficiency. They talk the talk, uh, they try to do something calculative, but uh, many people in the organization were not sure exactly what this means, what mutual good means. They were not sure that what they invest in really does something for the community. There were a lot of ambiguities. They were not outright against this, but it was more ambiguous rather than showing commitment. Similar organization, not exactly the same. It provides uh, financial services. Again, it used to be a credit union, but now it moves more, it moves more into health services, uh, home, disability, age, assistant living, and so on. And again, we see something very similar to what we saw in the back. We're not really. We don't want to make profit just for shareholders. We don't have shareholders. We do want to make profit, why? Because it makes us sustainable. We can do uh, more good things. So we see the same or very similar discourse about it, but they also have a problem. 
a problem of measurement. It's very difficult for them to, um, to identify exactly what it is that they do. Unlike uh, the three other organizations, no, so the first two organizations, remember, the first one, the serial one, they really know, knew what they did and how to measure it. The second one, they had a way to, they didn't measure that much, but they distributed. The bank and this one find themselves at a loss. How exactly do we measure the value creation that we have? And they, they, they told us very openly, what's missing from, from that, from, from the set of reports? is the community value aspect. They say, we are committed to community. We really try to do things better than, us and than everyone else. We're not thinking short term. We don't have shareholders. We turn down uh, deals that look good, that will make us a profit, but they are exploitative. We really try to be good citizens, but how do we, how do we demonstrate this? How can we show that we're really creating value that follows our identity, that follows our unique voice, we don't know. But basically from this, the community value aspect, the concept where you add things in that they are over and above profit. Now, again, I, I believe that this is genuine discourse because we heard, from, from, we heard it from different people. They were really trying to think how to do that, but they had a problem, they had a problem. They could not capture it. And I'd like to say that um, not being able to measure that, uh, how many of you do, does anyone do management accounting? No? So, so everyone probably know it as well that don't need to teach management accounting. What you measure is what you get or what you measure gets done and so on. We saw the lack of that in this organization. They were aiming to do something, but it was very difficult for them to reflect back to managers, to, to people within the organization, how well they do. They, they <coughs> use the numbers that would capture something. They were kind of going around in circles again and again and try this one and bringing that consultant and the other consultant and paying a lot of money for stuff that didn't really capture what they were doing. So they were at a loss in, in well-being. Let's put everything together. Uh, so again, these, these are just four organizations from, uh, from, from 12 that we looked at. This one, let me go. Did, right? Did, uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, serial call, we did see that the identity is, is tied very strongly to, to the profit of growers. Now, remember, the organization is not for profit, but it's very happy to help others, their, its members, to make profits. So this served as a very good, we would like to say, uh, identity serum. They really liked that. They identified with that. They kept on uh, coming generation after generation to the same organization, even though they had uh, temptations from outside. Now, economists among us, I'm sure, will, will, will be happy to say, yes, of course, incentives work. I agree. But, but incentives, remember, at what level? The incentives there definitely were felt in their pockets, but they were also felt hierarchy. They were also felt in the way they spoke about it. Because they, they did, we didn't hear in, in, in the dozens of interviews, we said, oh, I'm there just because the money is good. It was definitely that alongside a uh, feeling of commitment, feeling of loyalty, um, feeling of continuity. Okay. So we saw, yeah, we saw that. I, I didn't speak about the change manager because there's so many things, but this is the most important bit. Here we see a profit for purpose. So they do, they, they, they generate profits because they want to help their, uh, they want to, to advance their cause. We see it here, we see it here, we see it here, but at, at different degrees, it's kind of like the, the gradient going down how well they manage to use profit in order to generate their identity. Until we get here and we show this one where they're not sure. They basically say, yes, we do both. We do both profit and community, but how do we really show this? We don't know. They really have kind of unresolved tension between identity and profit. They talk about it, but they are not really managing to, to do that. Both, in both of them, actually, we can see that. We can see that there is, there's a problem here. In these two, they manage to, to somehow put together identity and profit in a, in, a, in a synergetic way that one helps the other. As a, I mean, this is our, 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 uh, our explanation, our interpretation. Here they did it with 
uh, calculating and distributing profits. Here they did it by creating these organizations that provide services. Here, they don't know what to do exactly. And many organizations, I gotta say, are here. They, you know, they, they, they know that they are not uh, pure for profit or they want to, to be somehow different. They want to have some distinction. I don't know if there are people here in marketing because I'm sure marketing people will have something to say about that. That part of their branding is that we are different. We have a different voice. We are not like everyone else. But when they start doing that, they realize that it's not as easy as said uh, as, you know, to do it. So let's discuss. Um, what do, we, what do we get from the paper? I'd like to suggest profit related practices. So we spoke about discursive, calculative, and structural. So they talk about it, they calculate it, and they also distribute it. They play an important role in identity practices. That's the main point that like, we wanted to, uh, to press. But beyond that, I think that we, uh, this I think is, a, is an interesting set, of, is an interesting argument for, for the accounting literature, because then, it, Quite a lot of implications can come out of that. For example, um, again, I'm talking more about less about financial reporting, more about internal usages of of uh, accounting figures. If we think about uh, first chapter in any management accounting uh, textbook, what would we like to create about to bring about in the in the organization with our incentive system? Goal congruence, right? Everyone will tell you we wake you up in the middle of the night. Yeah, go Congress, of course, and this is how we. And then we explain transfer pricing by doing this and all kinds of wonderful things. Terrific, but I think that we now go slightly into a deeper layer of of incentive of incentives than just uh, economic utility maximizing um, goal Congress, and that is the identity level. Uh, what we see here is that members who are stakeholders of the organization, right? I mean, they're not customers, they are more than customers, but also managers who are internal stakeholders of the organization tend to be more committed, work more, or I don't know if they work more effectively, but they, they, they tend to have less doubts and, and express more energy about their relationship with the organization when they see an alignment between what the profit does, how it's calculated, how it's distributed, to what the organization says about profit. So we can talk about identity alignment, right? Not just goal alignment that is uh, based on, on individual incentive. Now, I'm not saying that this doesn't work, okay? but I'm saying in addition to that, maybe we can find maybe a deeper layer or a, a neighboring layer that can help us understand um, Goal, goal congruence and, and alignment. So this is, this is interesting, why does it matter? Then, how does it work? We don't know yet. We, we were, as I told you, this is the first time we're presenting this, so I'm doing a bit of theory building on the fly here. Uh, we would like to say that maybe this is what drives it. We see all the time, remember what I told you, that when, once they, the, the, the stakeholders recognize that this, there is an alignment between what the organization says and what it does, they tend to, to trust it more, then if that's the case, we would like to assume that there is an ongoing, an implicit conversation. The organization says, look, this is what we do with your profit. Do you like it? And they may say, uh, maybe more percentage, or maybe give us some something that shows that you care about me more, and then they do something, and it's a back and forth conversation that organizations have with their stakeholders. Now, we see it again in... Well, no theory, we see it in, in accounting, but we still didn't see it so openly about profit, which again is a, is a, is a big blind spot because profit is the most obvious performance measurement. So these are you know initial takeaways, but these are very, very uh, soft. I, mean, you know, I just created them or thought about them in the last few days. So findings, you saw the, the story. Like to hear comments, questions, challenges, whatever you have. And thanks again for, for the opportunity. Yeah? Please. Uh, could I ask what's the difference between this identity and the corporate social responsibility? Um, because you're talking about and then contributing to charities, communities, there, both yeah. of them are in corporate responsibility. I, I agree. Uh, this is 
Uh, you're spot on. Uh, sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, you can call me Tim. Tim? Tim, yeah. Tim. You, you, you're, you're, very, you're right. Uh, one, one of the things that they said again and again in that organization, in another one that I didn't present, they say, how do we differ from these banks who basically say, oh, we contribute to you know, the rescue helicopter, or we contribute, which is basically CSR. You know, we, we... So that's part of their ambiguity with regard to their, to their identity. They were saying, are we really distinguishing ourselves well? So you're absolutely right. But, but you, see the, you see the point here. If, uh, and that kind of goes back to Geoia's uh, theory, it shows us that if they cannot really see the difference between what the organization claims that it is and other organizations, right, who, who, whom they know that they're, they're different, right? So, so think about there's a, there's, a, there's a cooperative bank that says, oh, we, you know, we don't have shareholders, we really try to do things for you. And then all it does is really putting aside some, some a uh, portion of their of their profit and they give it to some good causes and they see another one that does it you know contributes to i don't know uh, uh, whatever hungry children in africa or solving some problems here and there they say okay you know where is the distinction you're absolutely right yeah so that's part of the problem I'm, I'm now remember i'm not i'm not defending them i'm just putting it out there so you're right if they, so to the extent that they don't manage to do it they don't really manage to create a distinct identity They've got a problem. Their identity starts to crack. Make sense? Yeah. And could I ask the second question? Uh, could we get this identity information from annual report, the non-financial statement part? Because you know the CEO and then the director were writing statements at the very beginning of each annual report. So we are doing this, we're successful. This is one of the answer the question with the identity change. Because the statements always change. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's a, that's a good question. My answer is, I mean, I didn't think about it until now, but my answer would be, that's part of the of the ping pong of the conversation. So you're the reader of the of the accounts. Let's assume that you're a member of the or, or a supplier or whatever, a stakeholder in this in this organization, and you look at the set of accounts, and you know you've got the the CEO statement at the beginning and so on, and you're going. Hmm, do I really trust that they do what they say they do? Or like they, they actually perform their professed identity? You see what I'm saying? So the answer to, to the answer to the question, you know, can we really see that? Well, it depends on you. You see what I'm saying? Can you actually, would you trust them? Now, I, I, I want to, you know, I, I know where you're coming from because it's not it's not like a question of, of an analyst. Like I'm a smart analyst, I can see behind the, the, the curtain. No. It is, it is what we call a performative uh, circle. If you believe them, right, and you act as if you believe them, then they have an identity. You see what I'm saying? So you look at them and say, yes, I trust them. You know what? I'm going to tell my son to join the roadside assistance as well. And I'm going to tell him or her or my daughter that it's a good organization. Then, you see, you perform the identity. If you don't trust them, you say, mm, I don't know. Maybe I'll go for a commercial one because they give me better services. Then, then it doesn't work. You see what I'm saying? So it's it's part of a conversation. All right. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Now, could you just run us through um, how you in the study you were construing uh, empirically construing identity? So, what, what sources were you kind of Drawing on it. Um, so interviews, many, many interviews, and we, we asked them questions about. But basically, I'm going to be totally honest. We 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 went to the to the field and asked them about uh, what do they so what do they do that they think is good because we asked them about value generation mm -hmm. and and how do they know that they've done well mm -hmm. so about the measurement mm -hmm. right the identity came through it Peter. So when, when, when we ask them, how do you know that you do well? And they say, oh, I know that we do well when we do something that, that a commercial bank wouldn't do. And then we said, oh, what does that mean? And we said, we are more, more sustainable. We are not uh, short term. We're not uh, bonus chasers and so on, right? So, so when we ask them about it, what they do, they start talking about identity. So that one, uh, we looked at their accounts. So how did they 
basically struggle with, with capturing the notion of value generation, which again, as we saw, is part of their identity game. Uh, what else did we do? To, mm, mm. And, and we looked at their structure in the, in the organizations that, that told us, you see, this is what we do for our members. There's one organization that I showed here and another one that told us that the way they structure themselves is really reflecting and performing. I don't know how to use a different word, but basically demonstrating their identity. So this is what we did in Britain. Sorry to Please, 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 please. My anthropologist hat on here. Yeah. Just interesting. Please. So, um, so did they talk about identity? Was it, was identity a concept? Yeah. Which came through in. Yeah, yeah. They right. talk. They spoke about it. Yeah. We didn't go out looking for identity. So in a way, it was kind of a um, what do you call it? I forgot an anthropological break or a surprise. Yeah. We didn't do participant observation, not intentionally. Yeah. We 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 landed in our organization for about a week. And then we did as many interviews as we could. We snowballed within the organization. We tried to speak with suppliers and with customers and, and, every, and everyone else. We, we collected as many uh, documents that we could and kept our eyes open. And every, I can tell you, oh, so that's methodology. So uh, either three of us or the, the entire set of four, and then we had a postdoc. So sometimes we were five. Uh, usually when we would go to a city, so we went to, to Perth, mm -hmm. and we split into uh you know a group of three and a group of two and we do uh interviews for a week maybe slightly more and then every evening we would sit together and said right what are the insights what do we find and we re we would record these meetings and then listen to them at the end of the of the week yeah. so we didn't do participant observation but we did as much as we could to, to get yeah. close to that and it came from them so in a so way it gives it categories that are coming out from yes. from the discourse that you're getting from absolutely the and the coding and the I, and, and, the, and now I can say the coding really was grounded theory, really grounded theory, because we, we said, and again, we, we collected this, this, this data in order to develop the framework, but we knew that we were sitting on a gold mine, but we just needed to find what it is. Because so many interviews of people talking freely about their, their struggles is not something you come across every day, but, but it came from them. As soon as we started looking, we saw, right, it's identity. Okay, yeah. great. I know. Yeah, yeah. No, good question. Okay. Please. I am not. Okay. A, I, I I teach finance, but okay. I'm always interested. Is the identity coming after the profits, or the profits coming after? Because you know, you look at institutions and you say, "Hang on, this mission statement didn't exist before, or it's come uh -huh. more recently." You know, and then then you can see that there's sort of self branding yeah. when they've realized that they're actually good at something. I yeah, think. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, to be totally honest, I don't know, because, because for example, Gita, you could have uh, some reverse engineer, right? They, they, they would have a great year and they would make profits here or whatever it is, and they would say, ah, terrific. Now in the, in the, in the statement, and we see it, of course, we know, the first half of, of the statement, kind of the non-audited bit is all, you know, pictures of, of smiling babies and rainbows and all kinds of stuff like that, right? We know it. But, but what I can say is that in, in the interviews, and oh, and also we sat on, on quite a lot of meetings that they allowed us to sit on, they were definitely struggling with that. They wanted to, to um, so I'll, I'll, let, 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 let me try to answer it more directly. I think that they, they were trying to, to demonstrate and emphasize their identity because they thought it was good for them, for, for the soul, for, for their, their, you know, they liked it. And also they thought it would be good commercially because they thought, ah, people may come to us because they know that we are here for the long term. They know that we don't care about shareholders. You see? Yeah, but that's where I think that the identity comes later and the profits are there. You, know, you start off and you say, hang on, I've got to make a surplus because I have to survive. Yeah. And, and the surplus, you actually turn out to be good at something and making the surplus. I, I, I agree, I agree. And then you say, well, hang on, this is where I can sell myself. <laughs> I, I agree, I agree. I, I cannot, you know, at least I cut the, cut the knot of the causality here. Because because we, we didn't follow them for 10 years and say, ah, yeah, yeah, I can see organically how they became more profit and, you know, did some whitewashing. But but it's it's definitely that, you know, from, from the 12 organizations, they all spend a significant amount of time, managerial time, people sitting and thinking, in effect, they didn't call it identity, but what do we stand for? How do we demonstrate this? So 
they do care about it. It's not just something that they just say, ah, yeah, put a nice logo with some sunshine and, and leaves and whatever. Yeah. It's, it's not, you know, identity washing. Yeah. But, but you're right, it, I'm sure it goes in both directions, that they do some reverse engineering around profit, and, and maybe also the other way around. But great question, I don't think I can answer this. I mean, I wish, yes. I just wanted to follow on from you to what you said. Um, you know, in an industrial organization, I think, you know, when you have sort of look at structure, conduct, performance, right? That's yeah. the traditional model is profit is the end kind of indicator, yeah. or as we all know, yeah, from, yeah. Of, of what's happening in the organization. But when, but what seems to be, what you're looking at here is, which, which measures kind of the extrinsic value, right? Because you can measure it. Yes. Which, which yeah. is what's accounting is a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. But what the problem that these organizations have is measuring that more kind of intrinsic value that they're contributing as well. Correct. Okay. Correct. And, and, and so where profit now becomes a tool, not just an indicator or output, it becomes yep. a tool to perform. Absolutely. And how they relate to how they yeah. pay. So, so again, yeah. I, yes, I in, indeed. In, in, yeah, yeah. Profit is not just our representation, but it, it's always a tool, by the way. I want to tell you, in for-profit organizations, of course, many of the managerial bonuses are based on profit. So yeah, uh, but how exactly it stands, like, is there pure profit over there? Uh, sorry, is there pure identity building over there? I'd like to say no. I, don't, I, I mean, I'm not that naive. Facebook is a classic example, or there's so many of them which started off with something else and, yeah. and, and ended up with something else. Yeah, 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 indeed. So, so this is why I can, as, as I said, I, I don't have the, uh, no, you know, just, the longitudinal. This came to my mind, but you did say at the start that you didn't follow long enough. Yeah, know. but but you're absolutely right. There is definitely an interesting kind of give and take between kind of yeah. utility maximizing that says, oh yeah, yeah, people trust us, and this this would lead to more profit. But also, we we did see that they put a lot of energy into thinking yeah. how do we demonstrate our. Uh, our identity. I think it's is the it's time. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So let's uh, let's say uh, thank you. For, uh, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks, Brent. Now, if people want to hear about MVM or about the the framework, I'm happy to you know to come and present on this really because we are. It's it's again.